here. You didn't have to sound like a robot naming me. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ram Ramachandran. Uh, I work for IBM Research, specifically focused on accessibility related research. What that means is to make technology accessible to everyone, including people with disabilities. So we work on compliance, ADA compliance, like Section 508, and to voice recognition and captioning research. And we have been also focusing on cognitive uh, disabilities and uh, IoT off late. So um, we be. We are a small team, but we work on various aspects of uh, research that is related to accessibility. Uh, with me, uh, John Sanchez, he's the uh, architect, and Jenan Wang, one of the uh, researchers uh, in the team. So here, what we are going to do is just to throw out some of the possibilities that are there. Uh, with respect to robotics and uh, IoT. Um, so one of the possibility is that we all could put ourselves out of work and you know, robots could be serving beer for us. We just you know, sit around. <laughs> Next slide, please. So I'm assuming a lot of you know about as a service. What is as a service? Uh, and IBM's cloud. Can, can I have a show of hands who of uh, who, all of you who know about IBM's Bluemix cloud? Okay, this maybe 50%, 40, 50 percentage of you know about it. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction of the IBM Bluemix cloud. It's a platform as a service and it's again pay as you go. Uh, the competitors for that as you know, the AWS, Amazon Web Service, as well as Azure, Google's Cloud. Those are the uh, you know, big competitors that are out there. So what, what do you get from a platform as a service? Uh, IBM will manage everything up to the runtime. You are just responsible for the code and the data, uh, rest of it is all managed within the cloud environment. So you don't have to uh, take care of the uh, operating system updates or uh, you know other networking aspects or middle installing middleware. All of that is going to be provided to you uh, by the Bluemix uh, service. Um, why I brought up this is the IoT platform is also in the Bluemix uh, service, and that's what we have uh, integrated our robotic uh, demo with. Next slide, please. Uh, so it's composable services, so you don't have to be a PhD programmer to work on uh, the Bluemix infrastructure. Uh, you, you still need to have basic programming background uh, as well as uh, know what you what you're doing however you don't have you can actually uh, get the services through drag and drop and you can also uh, you know scale it as you need uh, it, it's all uh, everything can be configured within the Lumix infrastructure So, uh, where does Watson IoT come in? Uh, the IoT is another service within the Bluemix environment. Uh, so, uh, if you want to integrate your services in Bluemix with the uh, Watson IoT, and you know, if you want to use other Watson services, all of that can be done within uh, this environment. So uh, we do have a robot here. Uh, he will come, he will be present before you when we show the, the demo. He's hiding right now. Um, it's a, 
Elder Baron robot. Uh, it costs like what, eight to nine thousand dollars. We do have a bigger one, Pepper Robo too, that costs maybe uh, you know, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars now. The cost of all the robots are coming down uh, drastically, you know. And you know, I, I don't have to tell you about the IoT devices and how cheap the connectivity and the sensors are getting. I think you can get some of the IoT devices as uh, sensors for you know less than five bucks now and probably it's going to go down further. So what we what we wanted to do is as the cost of these things go down further, then it's going to open up a lot of possibilities. Uh, that's especially going to be true for um, people with disabilities and it will have also impact on elder care, aging, you know, people who want to be self-sufficient, stay at home. In all these scenarios, the robotics and IoT can play a big role. The robot actually works on a, uh, you know, the development and the environment is choreographed. It works, it has a Python SDK that you can use to connect and it has some of its sensors of its own. We're not listing everything, but you know, it has a camera, temperature sensor, solid motion detector, uh, and you know, it has a lot of freedom of uh, movement as well. Um, so uh, it has a number of sensors in itself. Uh, what we are doing is how can we enhance its sensing power? What can it do? if we start integrating that with the power of IoT and the power of analytics. That's what we're going to show a shot at all. Okay, John. Sure. All right, uh, hey, I'm John, and I'm an IBM Research Architect. How are y'all doing today? Yeah, yeah okay, great. <laughs> um, so what we're going to show is, uh, you know, we brought along our little Raspberry Pi here. Uh, and a camera and some subjects. Uh, are, they have Deacons in them as well. Um, but, and this we're just trying to show what we want to do. We put this inside of a home, right? So the idea is that what we're trying to do in this demo is extend the robot senses. Right now, the robot has vision, as Ron was saying, etc. He has a lot of senses, but what if there's something he can't perceive? And that's what we want to make use of IoT. And so. Typically, some devices, like other devices that are not attached to the robot, are connected via Bluetooth mechanism, and that's where the Raspberry Pi or some other end server would come into play. So, for example, my beacon, which is lying over there, it's a Bluetooth device that can be sensed, and you can understand how many meters it is away from the Raspberry Pi, for example. Um, but then, what we want to do is we want to collect that data, put it in a well-defined format. Uh, say like uh, somebody moved, for example, and send it to Watson IoT. That way we can make use of that uh, through Bluemix applications and other applications and we can use analytics on the data. And so in this demo, uh, the robot is actually an app listening to Watson IoT. So he, the robot himself is not um, perceiving the beacon. It's the Raspberry Pi that's going to be, in this case, the little Pi is running on my computer just for simplicity of this demo. But the, the computer is sensing the beacon and the robot reacts. So this is enhancing the uh, robot's, you know, holes. We can, any, any device that connects to IoT, the robot can perceive and possibly do some actions too. All right, so just to reiterate what I was saying, the robot has some built-in sensors himself, a lot of cool stuff, and he can move around. Um, but you know he's limited. Oh yeah, there's a question. Sure. Uh, how how does Watson? Uh, how does the robot talk to Watson? So where are your bandwidth limitations there? Um, the robot himself can connect to the Wi-Fi, uh, and he can connect. He can receive the actual IoT event himself. Yes. So you're actually using the Raspberry as a Bluetooth gateway. Exactly. Right, because you're in the home and my sensor tag. See, you want to have devices like this beacon or even some other household devices that, that this has no Wi-Fi connectivity whatsoever, but it does have 
potentially an accelerometer, and it tells you how far you are from a sensing device like the Pi, which costs 35 bucks, or even an iPhone or a watch. So yes, these things, we have to give it a little gateway, right, if you will. These things can't connect to the cloud, so we connect to an edge server, uh, like this little Raspberry Pi, which has all the capability to do everything we're talking about today. There's uh, also, we said a Python SDK, there's also a JavaScript SDK uh, for this uh, robot. And we're running, uh, on the Pi itself is running Node and Node-RED. And, uh, and in that, all the modules needed to do communications to Watson IoT, to do logic, to perceive the devices, it's all running on this little edge computer. And in this scenario, I have a little hub camera, a little camera connected. See, this camera could be used to fulfill the scenario. Our scenario is gonna be, I have a beacon, the Pi senses me, and to validate it's me, because this beacon is assigned to Johnny, uh, it's gonna take my picture and send it to me on a phone, and I can see it on uh, Flickr. But to do all that, um, it doesn't have the capability to move around. It's stationary. So we got a little robot to help out. He can perceive it, and maybe he can, maybe he can walk around. This scenario will just tilt his head a little bit. Um, but you know, this robot's pretty cool, but you know, he has a little mobility. He has a little bit of mobility issue once in a while. Rough environments, but you know we're pro we're prototyping and we're experimenting and trying to push the edge here. We can replace him with a more sophisticated robot. Uh, anyway, um, I have to consider all this stuff, right? We're leveraging Watson IoT to, like we just said, the the, the uh, this little beacon talks to the Pi, which talks to IoT, which now I have a little robot server. He listens to IoT, says, "Oh, somebody entered. I want to see if it's well. It says it's Johnny based on the beacon. I want to see if it really is Johnny." Um, and that's what we're doing, performing the correlation and the analytics. Um, and like I said, we can use an, an individual camera, uh, and that could be, you know, validating, or we can use something more sophisticated like the robot uh, to do the validation. Questions? Any more questions? No? Let's see. Oh, that's it. No more slides. So it's showtime. <laughs> this is where the fun begins, guys. Don't laugh. All right. This is a we're doing it real time right now, so you know things happen. So let me get it. I got a little bit of setup here. Uh, get going, and we'll see how we can work this out. Turn the overhead off for this. The remote's right in front of you. Oh, there you go. Let's get the light design. We don't want to make him angry. Yeah, it's okay. He's just hanging out, and he's pretty much no brains to him. So I'm starting up his brains over here. Let's see here. Let's get him going. How much intelligence is he on board, and how much does he depend on Watson? Right now, uh, Watson depends on, really the minimum it depends on is the IoT to do the events. Let me just see if he's okay. Are you okay? Oh. <laughs> I said, uh, are you ready? I am ready. Cool. So all right. All right. So, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm just starting up some server that's listening to IoT. Which could easily be the robot. So we're doing that right now. And so he's going to listen to IoT, and, uh, and I could show you the console. It starts sending events to IoT console. Uh, if you ever use the Watson IoT, all the events that get sent. There's some beacons. These guys have beacons, and there he's actually perceiving them. This like the Pi would be perceiving them, and the events are getting sent. It's something <coughs> moved. The word is assigned to that beacon. And uh, let me just. I just want to go and make sure that's all working. Yep. Okay, so, I hit the test. Let's see if it works. Um, here's a beacon. Now, I have the battery plugged out because I'm going to be way out there before you start sensing and I have to calibrate the distance. Uh, so when I put the battery in, it should think that I've entered the room and then 
you might want to validate. So let's just do that. Why don't you need it? But uh, this is the wrong part of the thing. You need the actual circuit. <laughs> Here we go. So I'm going to put the battery in. Let's see if you can see. Picture we could show you once you get the camera back on, then take a picture of y'all when it's looking for me. And now I'm here and I'm lingering around and he notices it, but then I can take the power out. See, this is imagine a person that's old uh, and we want to make sure he's in the home. He comes in, we want to validate it's him. So what do you think? Or he leaves and we don't want him to leave, but we want to know. So let's just power this off. So the beacon is like I walked out of distance. It waits about a few seconds. He wants to make sure that I'm really gone. I'm really gone. Thinking about it. He's pouting. <laughs> time I come approach, goes by IT, starts activating the phone. Now the, the point wasn't really to show the sophistication of the robot because you know, we spent minimal time on the robot, really getting the whole plumbing not into end plumbing working. We gotta get some sharp, cool developer dudes to make this guy do a lot more interesting things. Um, but yeah, really that's the demo. This this guy can do you know upload the images. With that image we can do face recognition. Furthermore, we didn't even do that. Um, we can send alerts, we can do whatever we want. Um, <laughs> he's a ham. Um, so any questions? So, does he walk? He can walk, but yeah. uh, if I walk, he might fall off the stage. Yeah. We have a false scenario. I can make that do that, but you guys might laugh. <laughs> uh, if I do the false scenario, he will definitely try to find me, take pictures. Can we give it a shot? No? <laughs> we will try to move. If he falls. Uh oh. This is on the fly now. Now we're going crazy. We're trying stuff on the fly. You make him fall, you might try to kick in the shin. Let's see if I, if I can even look it up. I think if I just say. I got the recurrent. Play dead. What's that? Play dead. Play dead. Um, I might have to look it up to, to get to do the problem. Maybe Rob or others can throw questions while I'm looking them up. Okay. Yeah. So. Sure. Yeah, let's do Q and A while John is looking at them. So, what's the communication between uh, your controlling laptop and the and the robot? This robot. Okay. So the controlling laptop, he has an SDK. We can run the Python example on the robot. Entirely on him. Yeah. We can run it on this network. Yeah, my question is what's the networking connection between the robot and the rest of it? This thing right here. <laughs> it, is it doesn't have to be there. It can he can connect to the Wi Fi, but you know, we don't know if this network's gonna allow accepting of server connections. So, so this is on a local network with your laptop? Yeah. Raspberry Pi. If, we could, if I took this out and I could figure it to point to my little uh, hotspot, it would work with that as well. Okay. So he, were, he has a Wi-Fi capability. 
but to make sure that everything was going smoothly, did the minimum configuration. Other questions? Yes. So I saw in your titles that uh, you were in a group for research for accessibility. <coughs> could you comment on use cases on accessibility where these could come handy? So we are, we are kind of broadening the definition of accessibility, right? In traditional sense, if you think about accessibility, it could be just Section 508 or American ADA, where uh, you are making your websites, your physical locations, all of that accessible to persons with disabilities. Now we are uh, kind of broadening uh, our research in this topic. Because if you think about it, a lot of the accessibility related technologies are mainstream now. Right? Uh, Voice recognition used to be a lot for people with disabilities, right? Now, you know, every iPhone, every every smartphone has it, right? Zoom, Pinch. Now, all of these were accessibility-related technologies. How the IoT and robotics could help is, you know, uh, they are extra sensors, right? Accessibility or disability is, you know, some of your sensing whether it is cognitive or otherwise it's kind of not quite the so it could help with independent living uh, it could help uh, people who are you know robotics can help with people aging people to live longer independently in their uh, home settings uh, instead of uh, going to an assistive care because uh, all these things are a lot cheaper now. So it's not going to cost you a fortune to wire the wire up. So you mentioned using Node-RED. So Node-RED is, is, your Node-RED instance is running a node on your iPod, right? That, that's correct. So the beauty of modern day programming languages is that, and uh, the way they download their dependencies is you can run the same logic on various devices with minimal change, if any. And so that's exactly running the same logic that would be running on the Raspberry Pi. So are you orchestrating all the, there's a, a, a Node-RED module that lets you control, to control this robot? There's a, right, so the Node-RED modules are two, there's a few of them. Uh, on Node-RED there's nodes, and one node is sending events that Watson IoT. Uh, there's another node that's listening to events on Watson LT. Uh, there's another node that's uh, receiving maybe uh, speech commands, because if I said I fell, he can actually respond to voice. I don't have that functioning right now, but if I say I fell, he receives it, sends the event, and the robot looks around. Um, and then the, there's outbound calls to the robot. The robot, the reason I have a server running is simplicity. I use Python and Flask, and there's a little Web REST API running on my notebook, or the, it could be on the Pi, and you just ship commands to him. You say, who gets of what you want him to do. And he, the Python logic uh, runs and communicates remotely through that cable or over the Wi Fi or directly on him. He, you can run the same stuff on him. It's, it's easier for now to, you know, because we're doing tests, a lot of testing. But that's how it all works. Other questions? Yes? Does he have his own camera? Why are you needing to use the webcam? I'm not. He up, the Flickr pictures are coming from the robot. So all the pictures were uploaded from the robot. He, well, this guy's stationary. So this is the point. The point is that we come into an existing home that has existing I, devices that are not necessarily IoT devices. But they're there and their data can be mined. We can then uh, form, just like, think about J2EE. Okay, this is what I like to make this comparison. We would have a J2E bean talking to a Kix database, and we'd have green screens and scraping the data and then formatting it to some XML or something that a modern day application can read and understand. Same concept with uh, legacy sensor devices. We could take advantage of things that are already deployed and installed, scrape the data, format it into some, uh, something that IoT can understand, and now a modern day application can respond to the events. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. Yeah, so. Is he uh, actively balancing right now, or is he? He's in autonomous life mode. 
So then, does he have like an equilibrium state? He does. He has all kinds of crazy stuff going on. I can turn it off. I can make him just do what I want. Huh. Right now, he's looking. He's trying to make eye contact. He's looking at motion. He's listening. Uh, but you know, uh, and he, if I write the right program, we can actually intercept those kind of events, like face detection. Somebody came by. They can do something. Um, but like I said, I'm not that sophisticated of a robot programmer yet. Uh, we're just doing the bare minimum. We're just scratching the surface, seeing what we can do. And John, he can actually wake up by himself if we place him down. Oh, right? I, yeah. I mean, he's a. I'll, I'll show you. I mean, I can make him do all kinds of cool stuff. But we'll do that right after we get some more questions. I will definitely do that. Question. Yes. Uh, when he listens to you, how does he understand the language? Oh. This is a good question. So he has his own built-in processor for language recognition. However, what I did in, the, in one of our prototype, it's not that great. Okay, but you know we're IBM, but we have all kinds of cool services like Watson Text to Speech and Watson Speech to Text. So when we do another the fall demo, a demo where I say I fell or take a picture or some other conversation that is recorded by this microphone here, not him. Uh, and this microphone sends it up to uh, Watson, and it says, okay, I read it. We have a little conversation logic running in the note read. We just get the text, parts, oh, I saw the text, take a picture. So then we make the robot say it. And the robot can talk, we make the robot talk. I have a sentence, um, and we can pipe that sentence response to the robot. Now, if the robot's not in the picture at all, um, this thing has a speaker that speaks, and when I say something, it goes to Watson text to speech. So the text, so it's a two-way thing. We, it's a long way to answer, I know. But yes, he can, so but we're leveraging cloud services to do all that. I guess the question is really, is the speech to text and text to speech done by Watson, or is it done by this robot? It, it, uh, it's, it can be done by the robot, but we use Watson because we found that it is not, it's, it's not the accuracy asking. and is much better with Watson services than what is embedded in here. Plus you can do it from a different microphone. <laughs> yes? So this is your base demo now. What does this demo look like in five years? What's your what's your roadmap? What's your dream, dream scenario for this kind of stuff? A robot will be standing instead of John. <laughs> <laughs> I will be collecting the checks. <laughs> At least a penny of it. Um, no, I just, you know, uh, we were just scratching the surface, like I said. We want to make, the, the, what we want to do is have uh, sensors working together, collaborating, uh, and validating things. Like, uh, I enter, is it John? And he's a mobile robot, so he can do something more sophisticated. Uh, I think it's, there's an infinite number of possibilities. Do you have any plans of uh, taking over the world with them? <laughs> okay. That's the team I want to be on. <laughs> yes. So I'm, I'm a little confused on the Watson IoT element. Right now, as I understand it, all you did was take the picture and Watson IoT just did this file yeah. handling to send yeah, it over to Flickr. You, what, how did you decide to take the picture? When did you decide to do that? When your um, be a beacon turned on. Exactly. And how did that beacon turn on? It's turned on. The probably noticed it, sent an event to Watson IoT. He could be anywhere in the world. Doesn't have to be on the same internet and respond to that beacon event. So that's how IoT played a role in this scenario. So the question is, what what's an IoT? I've heard I've heard this in the blue mix of uh, push for some six months now. Is this the same supercomputer that Mike Roden built in New York that won the Jeopardy um, contest some years ago, built out of 20,000 NVIDIA cores threaded together? Or is this a branding leverage of that piece of history in just some Watson code that lives on a server farm somewhere. <laughs> I don't know what, what they did with the Jeffrey computer. Maybe Ryan could answer. <laughs> I, I can take the question. Oh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Just in time. <laughs> By the way, I work for IBM, and I work on Boston IoTs, too. My name is Harry Gudori. 
Uh, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, Jeopardy was built with that special purpose machine five years ago. Uh, but right now, what we did is we took all, uh, we took the algorithms used in Jeopardy, in that Watson Jeopardy, and then they have all been made into separate services. So what you see on Globix today is a decomposed uh, Watson. So it's a bunch of different services. You can put those services together into different solutions. So for example, speech to text is a separate service. Text to speech is a separate service. Uh, classification of sentences to understand the intent behind what the user is asking is another service. Um, you know, there are 35 different services like that. You know, that's, that's how Watson has been decomposed and a lot of other solutions are being built. As far as your question on what's the connection between IoT and Watson, now IoT, as you can see, there are sensors. Sensors collect data. You can, you know, you can flow them into your cloud platform, and then you can apply analytics. This is what everybody does. But along with the analytics, you can do a lot of smart things because the Watson services are also available for you to combine with them. That, that's really what what Watson IoT is. Like the well, text hope that answers the question. If not, I can <laughs> give you more detail. So what began with Mike Roden's machine, the size of a semi-truck, right, right. has now been decomposed, I like it's, that word, it's into 35 different <coughs> pieces of supercomputing power, Correct. all as separately yeah. virtualized or partitioned services. They're all, they are, they're all decomposed into separate services, they're all cloud-based services. So for example, a million people could be using the Watson uh, speech-to-text service at the same time. A million people could be analyzing uh, speeches and trying to find the intent behind that. Or it, it also does. Uh, one of them is mood, mood, uh, mood service. So it, based on your speech, it can tell you what mood you are in. There are a number of other services there. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Great answer. Yeah. Yes? It still sounds like you're doing minimal processing. Watson is where most of the performance is. So it seems like your bandwidth limited. If not on the Wi-Fi, then maybe further up the uh, internet. Are you really getting enough? Are you not filling up the bandwidth pipe already? Particularly if somebody else is in the house. Oh, I the think it's, well. That's the thing. We're sending the minimal data enough to say do something, right? So my beacon is talking to the buy, and uh, it's enough to say. It's not about voice something. recognition. If you want voice, yes. The more sophisticated data, the more bandwidth you're going to use. Yeah, it's true. I mean, we have to have a network connection. For this, to leverage Watson LT, but like I said, this guy, the robot, could be, I can have my pie in my house, and the beacon sees it, and the robot in Japan could do something. So can the, the quality of service to make use of Watson and the different things it can do, can the quality of service be set to match the bandwidth all the way from low bandwidth free stuff that Watson can do to high bandwidth of fee-based services. It's possible. I don't know all the answers to those details. I do know that the uh, Watson LT itself has a quality of service that you can set. And, uh, but I really don't, I'm not the expert on that. I couldn't tell you all the details on that. Yes? As far as uh, the robot itself and all the, the mechanical hardware that you see there, is, is any of that anything off the shelf or is everything we see there custom made? Um, I don't know. We bought that guy from Aldebaran, and uh, yes, yeah, I feel like good. most of it is off the shelf, except I think he has a broken finger. John has used it, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I, I see to tie that. <laughs> I see the cast. <laughs> he, he can actually grab things too. He can walk to you. He can grab things. He can dance. He can perform. Lot of things. He's very mobile. You know, if, if uh, we place him down in a horizontal position, he can actually get up by himself. And, yeah, you know. we'll do that. I mean, but to also, you know, like I was saying, uh, just do that. Uh, you know, if you look at this little collection of toys I have here, that's like sixty bucks worth of stuff that can virtually do the same thing, except for it is immobile. So the point was. Um, you know, we can do the same kind of logic in Node Red, but the actual actuators, they're sensing, are doing the actual work of these 
a camera or be more sophisticated depending on your how much money you have. I can make the robot look around or I can have a stationary camera look around. Yes? John, how much of the services that you're using, uh, they have accelerometers and mobile devices and whatnot, how much does that exist in mobile devices today so you wouldn't have to buy some? Right, so, so mobile devices, uh, beacons, typically everything has <laughs> like a little temperature and accelerometer. Yeah. So it's, like I said, we want to leverage existing th things that are there. So I can work my phone, you know, if I had the phone on me and it had an accelerometer, we could detect I fell or, or I had a tremor in my hand. And then the robot's going to say, do you need help? You know, so yeah, there, there's no extra cost. The, the thing that's, to answer more question than the, you know, this guy, yeah, he's special. But we can wrap all these extra, the things that we have today, little watches that cost $100, iPhone watches, iPhone can detect I'm walking. It can detect, it can't detect I'm falling, but I can put, I can use accelerometer to make that happen in the watch. So we can leverage all these things and they all can communicate to IoT. So we can use those on data network. Right, so we can use all that technology existing tech. Yes, search. Yeah, so most of the most of that stuff really doesn't cost that much. You're going to get that with a lot of the mobile devices, the watches and whatnot. So, really, what you're doing here is you're you're taking uh, the cloud services that you can tie into the IoT infrastructure. They do natural language processing. You can push the authentication off to the mobile devices, all the biometrics. So if you needed information to tie to your personal data, you can have that, the authentic, you, the system doesn't even have to worry about that, you can use your mobile device to do that, and then you can tie that information back to information about yourself, what you've done during the day, all of those, all those things, what your personal preferences are, so really that whole infrastructure, the back, the back end can be used to be personalized to the individual to help them throughout their day. Absolutely. So what you're saying, Rich, I think is, you know, we're just being smart about the data we're collecting from devices that already exist. Right. right. The the beacon that you use, who makes that beacon? What silicon is in it? This is a Qualcomm, uh, Qualcomm beacon from, uh, I guess that's it, Qualcomm, but it's Gimbal. And this is like less than, this is about 10 bucks or less. Um, but, you know, I got some Ox beacons in here. Uh, I forget how much I paid for that a few years ago. The battery's still working on it. Um, so it's not that expensive. And then, you know, a, a watch, for example, this, this, this guy, he can be a beacon. He can broadcast a signal as a beacon. So I have a watch on me that can search for beacon so I can reverse it. I can see that my watch, I'm close to my room because the beacon's over there. Versus this guy saw John, I saw the room. So we can, you know, we can do it two ways. Uh, iPhone can see see beacons, and Android watch can see beacons as well, or phone. Yes, uh, yes. The, are you looking at moving some of these uh, advanced features like the watch and functionality, and at least some parts of it into the Edge device? Well, the way I would categorize the Edge device is just, it's just smart enough, you know, we could send accelerometer data over the cloud causing big bandwidth issues. But we don't want to do that. We want to have a little logic that says, oh, that's a fall. <laughs> What I saw was a fall. And so that kind of logic makes sense to put it close to where the events are occurring so we don't send a bunch of data up to the cloud. But when it comes to complicated things, you probably want that to be in the cloud. Are you working on creating you know, uh, intelligent systems to determine things like an accelerometer indication of a fall, a fall for the edge devices? Yeah, know, I mean, the only, the only thing I can say is, um, you know, the, the proof is what we're demonstrating that this little $35 thing runs no red, which makes sense of accelerometer data and says, you know, I fell. Or it can actually listen to the microphone. But he himself doesn't do the transcoding of the text. He sends it to Watson and it says, so, so we, where we can, you know, use the, the, the technology of this edge computer that has to connect things, we will try to. So right now, we are just using the edge devices to prevent even storms right, to the cloud, just as a filter. Uh, more as, as we go forward, you know, maybe that $35 thing will have a lot more computing power and you can do more sophisticated things in, in, in that. Well, I'm impressed, I'm impressed with these pies. They can do all kinds of cool stuff. Do you have any questions?
I, it was kind of related to that where now you've got, you know, the Pi Zero, I guess, has a GPU on it. So what I think would be interesting is having the ability for that to work in concert with Watson, where Watson could push, say, a, a couple convolution nets down to run on the, uh, on the GPU to do the pre-processing. So you're not trying to stream a raw image stream or a video stream. You're streaming the results of the convolution net much smaller data that then to do the, the heavy lifting machine learning. That still happens in Watson, but. No, I agree. At least I completely agree. I mean, let me give you a case in point. I wrote this thing called Accessible Location-Based Services, which does indoor tracking using beacons, and it has a database of the places with the images. Um, we had a problem where the network, we couldn't make connectivity to get the data, so we made a local database, an SQLite. And then we said, oh, let's get a little watch. And uh, we actually could synchronize the whole database onto the watch. It never went to the network. So it's just to your point. We got a lot of power in a lot of little devices, and we should make use of it. And we do. Other questions? OK, you guys ready for some more robot action? Is that it? <laughs> All right, I'll do a couple things. You'll do me a couple tricks, and then you get them ready. series of nine pictures and he wants to rotate around so he can get a pen. You know, his head will go so far. So he's going to try to rotate. And that's where the fun begins. if he wants to move or not. <laughs> and even though I told him to move, he's not because he's worried that he might fall. Um, and I have to turn, have to turn off autonomous mode to make him walk. Oh, look at that. He's done. This is, let me turn off autonomous mode. Okay, buddy. We'll have to get him a cordless you mic. Know I'm going to make him move. Like oh, that was making me. Making me mad. I'm going to stop him. And what he's doing is start him up again and make him do some stuff. Playtime's over.
try to talk to Baran and make the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> So right now, John, you're trying to control him from your laptop, right? Exactly. So this should do it. He's going to kick your ass. Yeah, he may be. He's thinking about it. He's thinking about it. He's like, what did you do to me? <laughs> Moves like me. <laughs> all right. That's all that we have for tonight. Thank you all for coming. And you know, all, all of you have a very good evening. Thank you.